Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Metaphysical Bible Study at the Empowerment Center. Thank you for being with us this evening, those of you who are in-house, and thank you for those, to those of you who are watching online via Facebook or YouTube. Thank you for being with us this evening. Tonight we have a wonderful lesson, a wonderful, wonderful lesson entitled Rules for a New Life, Rules for a New Life. So as we always begin at the Empowerment Center, we begin with prayer. So let's become still, settling all the chatter. That's in our mind, in our hearts, in our mouths, in quietness and stillness is our strength, in quietness and stillness. So God, we come to you this evening for strength. We come to you calling forth your wisdom. We come to you surrendering, not our will, but thine be done. Thank you, God, for each person, each family who's represented here and online. May they receive what they've come for. Thank you, God, that when I open my mouth, they hear your voice, not mine. And so it is. So it is. Jesus Christ is the head of this class. We open our minds and hearts to his teachings, for he is our guide to better living. And so it is. And so it is. Well, you see on your handout, there's a lot of lines. <laughs> so you know what that means. Right, right. And so I'd like to begin with a question for you. And actually, you can write it on, on the back, the very back of the paper. And for those of, of you who are watching online, I'd like you to do this exercise because it's really, really important to the lesson. So I'd like for you to write, to take a few minutes and write what a new life looks like for you. What does a new life look like for you? And just write what it looks like on, on, on the back. R write it on the back, on the back page. What does a new life look like? A few weeks ago, we resurrected, right? We crossed out a lot of things on Good Friday. And on Easter Sunday, we resurrected from those things. And so we have an idea of what this new life looks like for us. So just write it. A new life, a new way of being. A new way of living. A new way of thinking. A 
new way of feeling. Does your new life include a healthy body? Does your new life include prosperity of all kinds in every aspect of your life? Does your new life include great relationships? Does your new life include a strong family structure? Just some of the things. Remember, scripture says, write the vision, make it plain. And the part, the scripture, the verse that's right after that says, so he that readeth may run with it. But you have to make it plain. So that when someone walks up to you ready to give you something that you've asked for, you're clear about it. I asked for this. Thank you. Write the vision. Make it plain. Okay, just about... One more minute, and then we're going to keep moving. On the back. You're on the back. Mm-hmm. On the back. And for those of you online, we are in the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses... <laughs> We're going to begin with verse 17. Okay. Great. So we are going to begin with page three. Page three of the handout. Verse 17. And the topic for this segment says, the old ways have to go, has to go. There is no question about that. No question. If we want to have a new life, our old ways of being have to go. They have to go. I don't care how long you've you've had them. I don't care how many awards you've won because you had them, (laughs) right? They have to go. Why? Because two things can't occupy the same space. And if we have our old ways, we can't have a new life. And see, our old ways could be very positive. It doesn't mean they're negative. That's not what it means. It just means there's something better. Nothing wrong, just something better, something greater. And, and remember, if there was not something greater, we would still be listening to eight-track tapes. Right? But God kept giving us cassettes and CDs and DVDs and now we got little bitty things and now we don't even need any of that. 
We can just download it, right? And that's the same way our lives are. There's something better. And it looks small when we compare it to what we have before. Like this little jump drive looks small compared to an eight track, right? But it holds much more. And so that's what we have to open our minds to. It's not about the size. It's about the quality of life. It's about what we are given and what we do with what we've been given. Right? So verse 17 says, and so I insist, and God backs me up on this that there be no going along with the crowd. Now that's the first thing when it says the old ways have to go. Right? So one of the lines I want you to write, what have you been going along with? What crowd have you been going along with that you need to let go? Now, there are crowds of people. There are crowds of organizations that we are a part of. There are crowds of uh, family, friends, relationships, and then there are crowds of thoughts that are in our mind that we've picked up from all of these different people, organization, family members, relationships that we've picked up. And some of the crowds that we have to let go of are things we've made up. We've made up. Those are the, in my world, those are the worst ones, the ones that I make up and act like they're true and there ain't no truth in it nowhere. All right, so on line one, I want you to answer that question. What crowd have you been going along with that has not been for your Highest good. Because we're getting we're getting rid of these old ways of being. So let them come up out of your subconscious mind to your conscious mind so you can do something about it. And it wasn't me. Stop looking at me like that. You should see these looks I'm getting. (laughs) Right? And it might have been, you know. But you identify it. All right? Next it says, the empty-headed, mindless crowd. You know, the ones that don't make sense. The one that, when you finish talking to, you, you feel worse than you felt before you called, mm-hmm. right? Those, that is one of the crowds that I'm talking about or that they're talking about here. They've, they've refused for so long to deal with God that they've lost touch, not only with God, but with reality itself. But it, You're spending time listening to it. I'm spending time listening to it. Where I could be listening to something inspirational during that same time. So it's just just for us to take a look and see how are we spending our time. What kind of phone calls are you involved in every day? How many of them are positive phone calls? How many are productive? How many of them are helping you plan your new life? Or 
how many of them are trying to keep you right where you are and not move at all? It's comfortable. You know, it's comfortable when we're doing something we've been doing a long time because it's easy. It's challenging to do something new. But scripture also says that I should be able to speak to a mountain and it should move because I've spoken to it. Right? Isn't that what it says? Okay. They can't think straight anymore. Feeling no pain, they let themselves go in sexual obsession, addicted to every sort of perversion. All right? Now, this, remember, is the book of Ephesians. I want also put on one of your lines to look up in the metaphysical Bible dictionary, what does Ephesians mean? Or what does Ephesus mean? And so then you can connect the dots and see why these rules for a new life are important to this consciousness. What is the consciousness here that we're dealing with? No more going along with the crowd. When somebody appears to be empty-headed, mindless, pay attention to how much time you're giving that person. Don't talk about the person. If empty-headed and mindless is something or something similar that you're saying about it, the next question you should be asking yourself is, why am I spending time here? Why, what's attractive to, uh, what is attractive to me about this? If it's not for my highest good, if it doesn't make me feel good, if it doesn't move me forward, why am I spending so much time here? See, it, it's not the other person, it's you, it's me. Right? It's no different if I say, why do you come to the Empowerment Center, Center every week, week after week? Why do you come? You could answer me, and it would be a positive response. It wouldn't be because I like empty head, empty, mindless, <laughs> empty head and mind. That would not be your um, response. You would say, I like the love, I like the camaraderie, I like the stories, I like learning. I like That's the way... Everything should be in our lives. So productive that we can't wait to talk to that individual. We can't wait to be with that crowd of people. It doesn't just stop here. It should be everywhere you go. Why? Because you are there. Because you are there. All right? Verse 20. But that's no life for you. And, and here, it's in response to what we read in the first paragraph. But that's no life for you. You learned Christ. You know about the Christ. You know about the Christ. Week after week, you hear more and more about the Christ. You hear about it. You read about it. You experience it. So when you've learned something, you should be able to, or we should be, not able to, but we should, or we, I don't, I'm trying to use another word other than should. We can, in a productive way, in an exciting way, express what we've been learning. See, 
what we learn here should show in, our, in the rest of our lives. In the rest of our lives. Right? People used to always say, what church do you go to? Why didn't they? Because they could tell that there was a difference. And it's the same thing. It's no different than right here. Right here. Okay? My assumption is that you have paid careful attention to him, been well instructed in the truth precisely as we have it in Jesus. Right now, let me repeat that. My assumption is that you have paid careful attention to this Jesus that we've been talking about, to the Christ that's within you. You've paid careful attention to this. You've been well instructed in the truth precisely as we have it in Jesus. And so pull from your memory some of the things that Jesus did and write it on those, this next set of lines. What are some of the things that Jesus did that you thought were so wonderful? And write it. What are the wonderful things that Jesus did? Another thing I want you to write is what do you know about truth? What do you know about truth? And when I say no, I mean you know it. You don't doubt it. You don't fear it. You know this. There's certain things that you know about truth. Since then, and you can, you can write while I'm talking. Since then, we do not have the excuse of ignorance. Everything, and I do mean everything, connected with that old way of life has to go. It has to go. It's rotten through and through. Get rid of it. And then take on an entirely new way of life. A God-fashioned life. A life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct as God accurately reproduces reproduces his character in you. So you're writing about what you know to be true. Now, the next thing I'd like for you to write it's the part that I just read about what has to go. What's that part of you that you really don't like? Here it's referred to as that rotten, right? Remembering, remembering that God's will for us is absolute good. And what is that thing that you do or that you feel you don't have control of? What is that thing that has to go? OK. 
Okay? Now, the next thing is, what do you feel a God-fashioned life is? What is a God-fashioned life? What's your description of a God-fashioned life? And it tells you a little bit. It says it's a life renewed. Renewed. That means it wasn't always that way. So that's the good news, right? That this is a renewable thing that we can do. We can always be better. We can always get better. We can always let go and replace with something greater. And it says it's renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct as God accurately reproduces its character in you. But what has to happen first? We have to get rid of that, that thing those things that take us off, you know. It, it could be our, our temper. You know, it could be our impatience with ourselves, right? It could be not speaking up and letting someone know, don't, do that around me. Don't talk about that around me. I don't want that to be a part of my consciousness. It could be that. You know, it could be wanting to take more classes and not letting Reverend Rod know you want to take more classes. You just, you know, you're keeping it in yourself. And you may have a desire to be something and you're not speaking it. You're not going to the right, to the person and letting them know, how do I do this? How do I become a minister? How do I become a teacher? You know, how do I become whatever it is that you desire? So sometimes that's what has to go. The not speaking up for yourself has to go. And just saying, no, you know, just, no, oh, well, no, I can't. It's too late. It's too late to do, you know, that kind of consciousness. Sometimes we, we do that. But this says a God-fashioned life, a life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct as God accurately reproduces its character in you. Now, that's a wonderful thing to have as an option. Well, I have an option to have a God-fashioned life. It doesn't mean you can't party. It doesn't mean you can't play bid whist. It doesn't mean you can't drink. That's not what it says. It's just a God-fashioned life where you check in with God. Should I be at a seven? <laughs> or no Trump, or should I be at a seven low? Like, right? But, but a life where we check in with, with that power that's, that's within us. Okay? Let's turn the page. What this adds up to then is this. Okay, now here come the rules. <laughs> here come the rules. How many people like rules? Like to follow rules? <laughs> I got one hand. <laughs> okay, I love, I love an honest group, right? Don't like to follow rules, right? 
But these rules I think you'll enjoy. It says what this adds up to then is this. No more lies. No more lies. No more pretense. Tell your neighbor the truth. So let's go back to no more lies. Right? Let's go back to that one. No more lies. No more pretense. Who we hurt the most when we lie and when we pretend is ourselves. Right? Because most of the time, people know when you're lying. Right? Because most people are not good liars. Or they're such good liars that people don't believe anything that they say. <laughs> Right? They're like, oh, you know, you can't believe anything they say, right? But this is for you. This is not for someone else. This is not about what somebody else thinks about you. This is what you choose for yourself as a new life, as a rule for a new life. No more lies. No more lies to yourself. No more lies. No more saying that you're going to do something and you don't do it. And you don't have to say it to anybody but you. Right? No more pretense. What is it that you pretend? And if there's some things that you pretend, write it down so you can remind yourself. Don't, Henrietta, don't do that. Don't do that. You don't have to pretend here. God is within you. You know, God is within me. I don't have to pretend to be a child of God. I am made in this image and likeness. And that image and that likeness overpowers, overshadows everything else if I allow it to come forth or when I allow it to come forth. So no more lies, no more pretense. Tell your neighbor the truth. So what does that mean? Like I really don't like the fact that you run over my grass when you park your car. Like could you, you know, like rather than just to be angry about it and not say anything, you know, could you, could you please, right? Or, or, I love the music you play. <laughs> now, I didn't say that. That came from the crowd. <laughs> turn it down. <laughs> Can you turn it down? But the truth, the truth. Why? Because it's so much easier. And it clears, it clears everything. You know, it clears everything so that if somebody says, Henrietta, would you please not drive over my grass? Just because they've said it, now I'm going to pay attention to it. I may not have even been paying attention to it. But now because you said it, now I will pay attention. Don't drive over their grass. You know, or whatever it is that upsets someone else that you know upsets them, right? And so pretending like you don't know it upsets them and doing it anyway is the pretense, one of the ways that we have to let go of. Well, I'm just going to do, I'm just going to do it anyway. And if they don't like it, it's on them, <laughs> right? No, no, it comes right back to you. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over your grass, right? Because that's what you give out. So no more pretense. Okay? Tell your neighbor the truth. In Christ's body, we're all connected to each other. After all, when you lie to others, you end up 
lying to yourself. Has anybody ever had that experience? Okay. It, it wasn't fun, was it, when it came back? It wasn't, you know, it wasn't fun. When you ask yourself, well, why did that happen? God will usually show you. You remember when you did this, this, you know, and it flashes for me, it flashes right across here like a movie, you know, like a little video. And I'm like, okay, okay. Right? It says, go ahead and be angry. You do well to be angry, but don't use your anger as fuel for revenge. See, first we have to identify why am I angry? Why am I angry? And usually the first thing we'll say was they said so-and-so or they did so-and-so. And if you catch yourself blaming somebody else for your anger, you know to stop. Stop, just stop, because your anger comes from within you. And if you're blaming someone else for your anger, just say Henrietta. No, don't say Henrietta. <laughs> say your name. Now think about this. Think about this. Why are you angry? And sometimes you have to say it two, three, four times. Why am I angry? And it may not have anything to do with what just happened, but what happened before I left the house, or what happened in that phone call, that toxic phone call that I, I was a part of. And because of that, I go over here, and I say something, and there it is. So when you stop, when you get angry, you keep asking yourself, why am I angry until you can identify what you did, what you have done? what you were a part of, what you lied about, what you pretended. And once you get it, it's like refreshing. Oh, yep, I did that. I said that. I participated in that two-hour phone call that has me feeling whatever, I did that. I could have said, you know, this isn't a good time right now. I could have ended that conversation when it first felt uncomfortable. I could have ended that conversation. And so keep searching until you find what you have done. Then it says, and don't stay angry. Don't go to bed angry. Don't give the devil or the negative thought. Don't give your negative thoughts that kind of foothold in your life. <clears throat> because if it's anger, it's, it, it snowballs. And if you don't catch it, and figure it out, it's like agree with thine adversaries quickly. The faster you identify with your anger, identify what caused your anger, the faster you can let it go. But if you don't, if you choose to stay angry, it, 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 it's just going to grow. And it's going to grow into something that it didn't have to be if you had just stopped and say, okay, what did I do? What did I do? Don't allow your negative thinking 
to have a foothold in your life. Change it quickly. Did you use, did you used to make ends meet by stealing? Well, no more. These are some real interesting rules. Get an honest job so that you can help others who can't work. Did you used to make ends meet by stealing? Now, stealing doesn't always mean taking something that doesn't belong to you. It also means taking something from yourself, like peace of mind. Giving up your peace of mind in the name of helping somebody else. We steal from ourselves that way. We also steal from ourselves by spending time in negative conversation. That's time we could have been planning our new life or being around toxic people or people who have toxic energy, right? I always have choice. I can always excuse myself, always. But when I choose to stay in it, because the music might be good, you know, the music might be good, or something about it is good, I have to, I have to you know, I have to say, now is this worth this? How am I going to feel when I leave here? How much is this going to take me back? And I'm trying to move forward. I have to ask myself those questions. This is a new life we're talking about. The one that we, every time we nail things to the cross, we do it because we want a new life. Every time we burn stuff up in burning bowl, we do it because we want a new life. Right? Every time we change our style of dress, we do it because we want a new life. There are all kinds of things. We buy new glasses, right? We, we do all kinds of things. We do it because we want a new look, which represents a new life. So if we truly want a new life, let's follow the rules. These aren't rules for other people. <laughs> These are rules are for us. They're for us. And we can choose to follow them or not. But they all have a metaphysical meaning to them. Right? Stealing. A negative, I mean, a, a metaphysical meaning to that. Don't take something from me that I need, like time, and do something with it that's going to make me go to bed and stay in the bed for two days, right? When I could be up doing something. We have to think about it. Those are the, those are the things that in verse, I think it was 17, those are the things that have to go, have to go. When it says get an honest job, an honest job, I say put one of God's divine ideas into action. That's about as honest of a job you can have. If God has given you and God has a divine idea, put that into action. Because what God gives you is always for everyone. And it works because God gives it to you because you are the genius when it comes to this thing. Nobody else can do it like you. So if God gives me a genius idea and I bring it into fruition, it's going to bless everybody else. That's what this is talking about. 
so that you can help others. So that you can help others. But you can't help others with your with negativity, right? Or being the Debbie Downer. That can't come from your mouth. But when you bring forth your idea, it will make room for all others to come. When they look at you, they can see that they can do it as well. They may be the ones to help you with yours. See, that might be the very person that you need to help bring yours. And then after they help you with yours, you can help them with theirs. It, it's always more and more and more that God has for us. Just remember, eight track tapes. <laughs> that, just, I'm serious about that. Just remember that. Right? Okay. Let's go to the next page. 29. Watch the way you talk. Let nothing foul or dirty come out of your mouth. Say only what helps each word a gift. Each word a gift. Right? And you know how, how we used to talk about, why she's so happy? Why she's so happy all the time? Right? Because it works. And she's working it. And you can work it also. And just think if everything that came out of your mouth or my mouth was a gift to someone. That every time I said something, it blessed, healed, or prospered someone. Then what happens? That will come back to me, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Because I've set the law in motion. I've set the spiritual law of giving and receiving. I've set that law in motion. So what I want you to write is what are the things that come out of your mouth that you want to let go of. This is not for anybody else's eyes but yours. What are those things that you want to change that come out of your mouth? And after you finish writing that, write the things that you can say that will be gifts to people. You know that person that you find it hard to talk to? What is it that I can say to them that would really be a gift? Instead of maybe complaining about something, what is it? that I can share in celebration of what God has done through me. And I want, you know, you can finish this later, but just go back and, and fill in these so you can look at them. And while you're working on this new life, you kind of have a, a blueprint to go by. Number 30, it says, don't grieve God. Don't break its heart, its Holy Spirit, moving and breathing in you. It's the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for yourself. Yourself, change that. Don't take such a gift for granted. 
Don't grieve God. Don't act like God is gone. Don't act like you had your one and only chance with God and you don't have another chance. Don't, don't do that. Don't make that up and act like it's true. God is the only presence, the only power, the one power, one activity that's in your life. Which is absolute good. You have access. We have access to absolute good at all times. But oftentimes, because we have these things that we haven't let go of, these things that we've written about tonight, we think that keeps us from God. And it does not. Nothing keeps us from God. Nothing. And if those are the thoughts that are in your mind, those are some of the things you need to let go of. God's will is absolute good for me. I don't care what I've done. God's will is absolute good. So when I say, not my will, but thine be done, I'm asking that the, the power and the presence of God, the forgiving power of God, the healing power of God, the prospering power of God, come forth in my life anyway, no matter what I've done, no matter what I've said, no matter how I've acted, I'm calling it forth and I'm surrendering. I'm getting rid of all the judgment, all the shame, all the guilt, all the doubt. I'm getting rid of it so that I have room for God's goodness in my life. That's the reason we do this. It says, my, this, this communication with God that, that Reverend Rod talks about every week to become familiar with this God within you is the most intimate part of our lives, the most intimate part. There's no intimacy like the intimacy of God. And I can call on it all night and all day long. How blessed is that? How blessed are we that we have access to that? at all times, okay? And finally, verses 30, 32, it says, make a clean break with all cutting, backbiting, profane talk. Make a clean break. Be gentle with one another and sensitive. And I'm going to add to that one, be gentle with yourself. Here's an affirmation for you to write. I am gentle with myself. I am kind to myself. That means I say good things about me. I am proud of myself. I feel good about the new life that I'm stepping into. Led, guided, 
led, guided, and directed by God. And the final statement says, forgive one another as quickly and thoroughly as God in Christ forgave you. I want you to write that statement 24 times. <laughs> okay, and just change the you to me. Or, and add, I forgive, here, here's the affirmation. I forgive myself and I forgive others quickly. I forgive myself and I forgive others quickly. Make sure you go back and fill in the blanks that, um, you know, the, the other blanks. Make sure you fill those in. And the first couple of pages is just the beginning of the chapter. God bless you. And thank you for being here tonight. It is now time for us to give just a lot. I'm not going to say I'm not going to say a little bit. It's time for us to give. And there are four ways to give to the Empowerment Center for Better Living. You can go to our website empowerliving.org. empowerliving.org. empower e m powerliving.org and click on the donate tab. You can zell, and you zell to give at empowerliving.org. In the comments, please put your name and address if you zell. Give at empowerliving.org. You can give through Cash App, dollar sign ECBL. And in the comments, please put your name and address. Or you can mail your uh, offering to the Empowerment Center, Post Office Box 7426, Chicago 60680. Together, I give freely from the rich, radiant, unlimited substance of God. As I give, it is immediately being replaced with even more. Thank you, God, for the million-fold increase. And so it is. You know, that's also a good prayer. That's a really good prayer um, that we have that we can use at any time. Anytime we're getting ready to go somewhere, do something, I give freely. See, I can say that and it, it will empower me. Reverend, you coming? Okay, good. Taking a, really taking the night off. Thank you, good for you. Good. Well, thank you everyone for being here this evening. Thank you to those of you online. Remember, we have already chosen a new life. We've already chosen a new life. So these are just some rules for us to follow. Remember, these are not rules for others. These are rules for us to follow, right? Let's become still. God, we thank you for this wonderful lesson. We thank you for the beautiful weather. God, thank you for each and every day that you've given us. Thank you for our new lives, God. Thank you that you've given us some of the rules to follow. 
God, thank you for opening our minds and our hearts so that we can have the life you desire for us. And so it is. The light of God, the love of God, the power of God, and the presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is, and so it is. God bless you. Thank you.